Jude chapter 1. And let's look at verse 1. Jude 1 verse 1. It says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was need for me, needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Lord, help us now as we look at this. And Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 3 is uh, really what I want to look at tonight. And... Um, it talks about the common salvation, that that first thought there, the common salvation. You know, um, uh, look at Leviticus chapter 4 for just a moment. Leviticus chapter 4. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. The common salvation. Leviticus 4, and look at verse 27. It says, And if any one of the common people sin through ignorance, when he doeth somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord, and the verse goes on, but the wording, if any one of the common people sin through ignorance, that's the first time the word common appears. And um, it, it's implying uh, the man on the street, as opposed to, you know, in, in this passage, he's not talking about royalty. He's not talking about the priests. He's not talking about some exalted individual in this particular verse. He's talking about the common people. And um, common, it just means the average, at least in the first time it's mentioned, it seems to follow that thought, just the average everyday guy. You know, in Acts 17, 30, it says, God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And uh, when you look up the word um, uh, common uh, in the old dictionary, it really carries that thought. It's just general. It's for everybody, everywhere. Um, in number 16, it talks about the common death of all men. So the common salvation is... The salvation, that's for everybody. And he says here in this verse, I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. And he said, and when I did, he said it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Um, the faith. And uh, that's really what I want to talk about tonight. Um, it is the faith, and he specifies it. The faith once delivered to the saints. It was once delivered. It would not be re-delivered. You know, there's a lot of groups out there. Every cult group that you know of, every one of them, you know, their, their claim to fame is uh, their prophet who had a vision. You know, sometimes it was a man, sometimes it was a woman. And, you know, they said that real Christianity had been lost and so an angel visited them, and it was re-delivered. But the Bible says that um, uh, the faith, the faith, was once delivered. It would not be re-delivered. It would not be modified. And that's really where we're at, and I'm not going to be long tonight. It's, it's going to be pretty simple tonight. Um, but you know what the big pressure is, and, and you're going to keep seeing this. You're going to keep experiencing it. And it sort of hits you from all sorts of angles. Uh, if you're on um, social media, if you um, have people forwarding you uh, songs and little clips and all that stuff, and there's some good ones. Um, but one of the things that you just, we've gotten so used to it, I, you almost don't even notice it. But there is always this push to modify what used to be original Christianity. You know, original Christianity is very frowned on today by most Christianity. Um, you know, it, it was the, the faith once delivered. 
It would never be re-delivered. It would never be modified due to changes in culture or people's receptiveness or, you know, the winds or the, the, the new fads and all that. You know, the, the big move in the last 75 years has been, you know, that, that old Christianity, we've got to tone it down. We've got to tone it down. It was Francis Schaeffer, no less, <clears throat> who was on the cutting edge of actually bringing in what today is the contemporary movement. At the end of his life, he wrote a book. And the name of that book, it is an excellent book. And it's, you know, it's probably out of print, but you can order it online. And um, uh, that, that book, he talks about, it was one of his final books that he wrote. And it was, uh, he talked about all that had happened in his lifetime as he's looking back. And he said, man, he said, Christianity totally changed. He said, um, you know, in so many ways. And he said, one of the things Christianity began to do, and this book is famous for this quote. He said, Christianity decided that it needed to accommodate the culture to reach the culture. And he said, but looking back, he said, I can see that accommodation always leads to accommodation which always leads to accommodation. He said, it never ends once you start. The move for many years now has been tone it down, tone it down, move away, move away from the old time religion. You know, there's a song we used to sing and the song became a mockery. The song became a joke, but the song as it was originally written was meant to be a blessing. And I remember hearing it as a kid. And when I was a kid, all the church people knew it. But the song is, I love that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. It was good for our fathers. It was good. And it just goes verse after verse after verse talks about that old time religion. Jude said it was needful. And Jude is an end time book. So it's right before Revelation. The placing of the book is strategic in the Bible. And he says it was needful to tell you to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. That faith. The standard was set at the beginning of the church. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, For I delivered unto you that which I also received. And he says, you know, first of all, he talks about the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. In fact, you're in Jude. If you just go back a few pages, you'll see Hebrews Look at Hebrews 2. We, if you've ever studied church history, and you know that um, you, you really, it's amazing when you, when you study church history. But you know, real Christianity, Bible Christianity has always been the same. And it's never morphed until the last 75 years. The last 75 years, it started morphing into something that is not the faith once delivered to the saints. It doesn't matter how far back you go in church history. Um, the Bible preachers, the movers and shakers in Christianity, they were guys that literally thundered from the pulpits. You ought to read the history of the church. You ought to read the great preachers all through the ages uh, the great men that God used and the people that shaped everything, they thundered from the pulpits. They were like the Old Testament prophets. And it's always been the same. Isaiah. Lift up thy voice like a 
trumpet and show my people their transgressions. You got to look up the word preaching in the old dictionary and then look up how many times the word cry appears. Uh, that dictionary is about nine, nine definitions of the word preach, nine or ten, and every one of them is crying out, crying out, crying out, crying out. Um, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. And Noah, I'm um, excuse me, and Jonah went into the city a day's journey and cried. Yet 40 days. And then Michelle, but you know what we got today? We got all these guys, and I realize not everybody's the same, and I and I realize some guys are not trying to be compromisers, not it, not everybody's bombastic. I, I get that, but um, but you know, today is the day where it's it's not the problem of the personality, it's the problem of what they don't want. That's the problem. You know, we've had it here. You've seen it. You know, um, man, I've seen it over and over. And uh, you get somebody that comes out of one of these, um, you know, the, the different faith, not, not the faith once delivered to the saints. But they're coming from another kind of a church that may preach the gospel, but it's not the faith once delivered to the saints. And they come into our kind of a church. And, you know, uh, the preacher starts to raise his voice and like, they're like, they're like, if maybe they'll make it through the service and they're never going to come back. And what was the problem? The volume. Um, it was too blunt. You know, you don't see Jesus. You don't see any of the prophets ever. I understand there's ditches on both sides of the roads. Man, I get that. And I quoted it last week. It, Solomon, and I believe in this. Solomon said, I sought to find out acceptable words. And I think a preacher, if as he grows, and pre preachers are like everybody else. They're always growing. You're always tweaking. You, uh, Man, if he's worth his salt, he's always trying to reach people, and he's trying to tweak that. But you can't deviate from the Bible pattern. You can't. You can't become this guy that's always trying to accommodate everybody because accommodation leads to accommodation and it never ceases. It never ceases. Look at Hebrews 2. The faith once delivered to the saints. The faith once delivered to the saints. Hebrews 2, verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Now watch, which at the first, this great salvation, what's the reference point? At the first began to be so spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Look at Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. A lot of you guys are familiar with uh, the, the, the thing uh, that swept through the churches, you know, quite a number of years ago. Well, I, I say quite a number. It's, it's been in the last 20 years. And it was the, the purpose-driven church thing. And so, you know, everybody gets on board this thing, you know, and they're, they're all doing this program, you know. And um, I had a friend that was, you know, watching all this, you know, and, and he said, really, he said, it's, it's not purpose driven. It's, it's people driven. It's people driven. Um, the guy that helped launch that, one of the things that gave birth to that. Now, this is what I'm talking about. The faith once delivered to the saint. The, it's the faith. The word the means one and only. It is exclusive. What gave birth to that was uh, these guys went into a neighborhood and they decided they were going to start a church. So they started going door to door to door to door to door. And they said, what was it that, you know, you didn't like in the churches that you attended? So so they got, you know, they, they hit hundreds of doors. And, and they uh, they decided that they would come up with the church 
that everybody could be happy with. But I have a question. Who is it that is supposed to be happy? Help me out. The Lord. So you wind up with the church that's about accommodating instead of pleasing the Lord. Um, look at Mark chapter 1, verse 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Look at verse 14. Now, after that John was put into prison, Jesus came into the gospel preaching. It came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So Mark says this is the beginning of the gospel of God. And there you have it. Jesus comes in and he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And, uh, and the message is, repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, and he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. So, you know, right off the get-go, the, the faith wants to deliver to the saints. It's a message of repent and believe. And it's a message of, Let's go get everybody else we can. Look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke 1 verse 1. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. Look at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Beware uh, that, you know, as time goes along, um, you're going to be really tempted to um, embrace. Um, and and there's, the push is on. I mean, it never, ever, ever lets up. And, and, and sometimes it's very subtle. But, you know, they're, they're trying to modify your Christianity. And they're trying to guilt you if you're not going that direction. And, you know, I, I'm not saying you have to be hard or harsh or ignorant. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying beware of this push to, to tone it down and to go a different direction, our reference point is from the very first. And our Christianity should match this. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. And it goes on there. And, uh, man, you wind up in verse 8, and Jesus tells them to, you know, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It is the faith once delivered unto the saints. In Ephesians 2, it says, Our faith is built upon the foundation, upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. The saints of that faith, of the faith once delivered to the saints, they all had the same message. It was the faith. There wasn't a bunch of variation. There wasn't a bunch of pet doctrines. There wasn't all these widely differing emphasis. There weren't all these widely differing opinions. It was the Faith. Look at 1 Corinthians 1 for a moment. 1 Corinthians 1. Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians.
1 Corinthians 1. Now watch the wording. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. First Corinthians one, verse 10. Okay. And let me tell you guys something. So, you know, a lot of you younger people in here, some of you, that, some of you older Christians, I mean, this really applies to you too, but some of you younger people, you know, um, and some of you, you know, we got some of you that are in the ministry or heading that way. And um, here's what, here's what's going to happen. You know, there's polit politics at every level of everything and including Christianity. It is, it is rotten with politics. And, you know, um, you're going to have people that show an interest in you. You're going to have people that, um, uh, you know, want to take you under their wing. And and you're going to some of you are going to be in that place where I already know we, uh, one of the brothers and I were talking the other day and he's looking forward to the day when he's going to raise support. And that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that as long as. You don't compromise who you are. I will always be thankful to my dad. My dad was a man's man. He was not ignorant and he was not an idiot. But I'm telling you what, man, he was a man. I mean, nobody was going to back him into a corner. Nobody was going to pressure him to do anything. He would be nice and gracious and smile. And uh, but, you know, he wasn't going to budge. I mean, if he believed something was right, it didn't matter what the relative said. It didn't matter what mom said. And, and I think you ought to love your wife and listen to her. And she, she can help you out all sorts of ways. But there's a big difference between that and mama being the neck that turns the head. When daddy got something in his head that this was what God wanted us to do. And when it, it was just, you know, or there was something in the house that need gotten rid of. Or there was something that needed changed. Or it was just, <laughs> that's the way it was going to be. Nobody was going to back him into a corner. Nobody was going to intimidate him. Nobody was going to buy him off. And I watched him stand. And it just stirred me to my core. You don't see much of that today. And you're going to have people that where it gets sticky is when money gets involved. And then somebody threatens you and says, oh, well, you know, oh, you're you're not exactly like one of us. I had uh, some friends of mine that were at a big mission conference, and um, there was two or three of them, and it was a big mission conference, big church, big money, and a lot of these missionaries, if this church took them on, it was going to be for a sizable amount. But this church belonged to a certain wing of the Baptist that had a couple pet doctrines. So what they did one evening was they rounded up all the missionaries, and they got him. They had a meeting with him before the service. And they said, all right, guys. They said, now we know some of you, but we don't know all of you. And they said, just want you to know, uh, you're going to have to sign a statement if, if, you're, if we're going to support you. And, um, and we believe these couple things. And, uh, and they said, um, you know, if you're, not, if you're not one of us, you should probably leave the building now. And... Um, you know, for some of those guys, it was a real test because it's not easy raising support. And a couple of them looked at each other and said, well, and, and it wasn't that anybody hated each other. Nobody was cussing at each other. But it's like, well, boom, time to go. And they stood up and left and blessed them that they would not sell themselves. God knows how to take care of his own. The faith once delivered to the saints. Um, look at 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. In that early era, in that early era, you know, there, there, wasn't, there wasn't a zillion and one side issues that everybody had to take sides over. Now, I realize in this day and age, you know, you know by default, you, you're going you're gonna to have to make some decisions. That's just the way it is. But I'm talking about the faith wants to live to the saints. And, you know, it, wherever you locate, you know, you need to make sure that you are concerned 
about the faith, this faith right here, that was delivered to the apostles. And, and that's where you need to make sure you line up. They, all those guys, they all said the same thing. They were all marching. Now their personalities were all different, you know, but they were all going the same direction. It was all about Christ and him crucified. And they knew they had to shine his lights in the world. And they knew that the world was going to hell and they knew not to love the world. And they all knew that Christ was coming and they were all on the same path. That was the faith once delivered to the saints. This faith does not need re-delivered or repackaged. It needs to be revisited. The faith. And of course, there would be counterfeits. You know, he talks about another gospel, another Jesus, another spirit. And uh, But there was only one common salvation. And there was one the faith. And there would not be a revised edition. So with all that said, I just real quick... You know, I want to go to Acts chapter 3 for a moment, and we'll we'll end up right here. Acts 3. The faith. The first time the phrase, the faith, appears is in this verse. And after, after this spot, it shows up many more times in the New Testament. It's interesting, you will never find the phrase, a faith. It does not appear in your Bible. It is the faith. You know, people say, well, you know, there's 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 many faiths. No, um, there is the faith. There is the faith. Somebody says, I have faith. Well, that's good. But the question is, do you have the faith? Um, look at Acts chapter 9. I'm sorry, Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, verse 9. Acts chapter 3, verse 9. This guy gets healed. And in verse 9, it says, And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why ye look so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know, yea, the faith, which is by him, by Jesus Christ, hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And this is the first time that phrase appears, the faith. So just a few thoughts tonight about the faith from this little passage here. The faith is by Jesus Christ. The faith which is by him. It is the faith that comes by way of Jesus Christ. It is connected entirely to him. It's not, it's not a, you know, an emotion and a feeling and a and all that stuff, although although sometimes that's part of it, or maybe that springs out of it, um, but it is it is connected entirely to Jesus Christ. That is the faith. It is faith in His name, and this faith in His name made a weak man strong. It made a weak man strong. It changed a man that they knew. It changed a man that they knew. It gave him perfect soundness. I mean, suddenly he was he was all back together. Um, it, it really altered him even physically. Now I know this was this was, you know, early in the book of Acts and the Jews require a sign and, and I understand all that. 
But we're talking about the faith. It, it didn't give him half soundness. You know, picture it. This guy is, has, he's there by the gate, beautiful, and he's never walked. And uh, when Peter reached down and grabbed his hand, it says his feet and his ankle bones received strength. You can imagine if you've never walked, um, you ever seen anybody that's, that's, you know, they've got a muscle that they've never used? That thing atrophies. I mean, it looks awful. Uh, you get somebody that has a, a, a leg they've never used, and, and but they've got a normal leg that they use a lot. And the one leg is very strong. The other leg is all shriveled up. And so not only could this man suddenly stand up. You know, the Lord never half did anything. He never half did anything. When this guy gets healed, he doesn't just stand up and go, well, this is wonderful. I can walk. You know, and his leg's still about this big around on the other, you know, and he's, praise the Lord. You know, that's what the modern healers did. You know, when Jesus did it, it says Peter reached down and grabbed him, and in the name, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. <clears throat> and he says, he stands up, and next thing you know, he is leaping. You know what? All of a sudden, this leg was this big. Now it looks it looks just, I mean, he's got his leg back, and it's just as muscular as anybody else's, and it's strong, and he can leap. The faith gave him perfect soundness. The faith. Look at Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, verse 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now, that last phrase is a mouthful on two counts. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So suddenly... A bunch of the the priests, you know, and these were the same guys that would have nailed Jesus to the cross. Now they have embraced, they were obedient to the faith. So now they have opened their heart. They have embraced Jesus Christ. So you know what that meant? They had to leave their religion, just like Paul did. They had to leave their rituals. They had to leave their prestige. They, they had, you know, they had a lifelong position. You know, they had a pension plan. They were taken care of for life if they just stay in the priesthood. Um, they had they their livelihood. They left it all. I knew a guy that uh, became friends with a Catholic priest in uh, in Pennsylvania. And the guy was he was a, he was an independent Baptist preacher. I don't know how the connection came about. But he said, but I met this Catholic priest and he said, we began to strike up conversations. He said, next thing you know, we were going out for coffee together. And he said, we developed friendship. And he said, of course, for me, he said, I knew that where that was headed. He said, it wasn't just about having coffee. He said, I wanted to try to win him to the Lord. He said, the day came and we're sitting there and we're talking. And I looked at him and I said, uh, you know, so-and-so, he said, uh, have you ever been saved? Uh, have you ever given your life truly to Jesus Christ? And the, and the priest goes, are you talking about that born again stuff? And he goes, I am. And here's what the priest said. The priest said, he said, I know what you guys believe is right. But he said, but if I embrace what you believe, I lose everything. A great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So what does the faith do? The faith, it's like that pearl of great price. The guy finds it out in the field and he sells all that he hath and buys that field. It's worth, it's worth everything. 
they're willing to let it cost them everything. We're talking about the faith. But it also says something else in this verse. A great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. The faith. It's not something that you just, you know, somebody tells you about, you know, and, and somebody just goes, oh, yeah, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, you know, yeah, I think, you know, I think you're right. You know, I've been wrong about that all these years, you know. Yeah, I guess I'll believe that too now. Is that salvation? It is not. Jude said, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you to earnestly contend for the faith. The faith was something that caused everybody that embraced it to be obedient to it. It changed their whole direction. It changed their whole life. Now, as I end on that note, I don't, I don't think anybody really would disagree with me there. Um, again, I'm talking about the faith. And you know when you talk about this stuff, everybody says, oh, preacher. You know, well, it's, un it's an unspoken thing. Um, you guys don't have any trouble with this. You've been around here. You're used to this. But you're surrounded by people that call themselves Christians. And you know what they're always doing? They're always, it's, it's, it's wild. These people with this, and I say it, I don't mean this ugly, but with this anemic, effeminate, watered down, you know what they're always doing? They're, they're always trying to, they're not afraid to tell you about their faith. You know, and, and they've got all their posts about their faith, their faith, their faith. But some of them, it becomes apparent that the more you follow them and the more you really pay attention to what they're doing, their faith is not the faith. It is not. There is no resemblance. And what they're trying to do to you, albeit maybe even unconsciously, is they're trying to bring you down to their level. Because if you stay where you are, there's something about where you are that is a condemnation of where they are. And it just, it bothers them. The faith. So I close with this. You, if you're writing down verses, write down write 2 Corinthians 13, 5. So here's what everybody, here's where you always come down to. Anytime you start talking like this, here's where you come down to. Somebody says, well, you know, I know some people and I think they're good people. And, you know, they, I don't think we all have to be radical. All I know is the faith that was delivered to the apostles, it sure was radical. And that's the only faith the Lord recognizes. Well, he recognizes the faith of devils, but the faith of devils does not save them. And somebody says, well, well, pastor, can't somebody truly be saved and be very carnal? And the answer is, yes. But you need to remember something. There was a carnal church, and it was so carnal. When you read the book of 1 Corinthians, you have to marvel that the Lord even called it a church. You really do. Um, it was terrible. But you have to remember that, first of all, in chapter 1, he does talk about how that the testimony of Jesus Christ had been confirmed in them. How? First of all, the people that were saved in Corinth had been saved out of, out of that idolatry in Corinth that was served by a thousand temple prostitutes on the mountain of Corinth. So when they got saved, I mean, they, they really left some abomination. And so a lot of those people that were saved in Corinth, they, they generally initially exhibited a, a dramatic change that the faith always brings. But the problem is, you know, it just got carnal and carnal and crazy stuff started going on in the church. And, and you know, that becomes that, that becomes the defensive line when somebody says, well, pastor, you know, I, I think some of these people, they're, they're just carnal. And, and I'm like, yeah, that could be. But you got to remember, Paul closes out 2 Corinthians. 
And he says this to those people. He says, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. He was pointing to those guys, Corinthians. He said, guys, he said, a bunch of you, he said, a bunch of you are saved and you're carnal. And, and, if, and you know, God ch ch chastens his own. God is going to beat the devil out of them if they're saved. He really is. But you know what? And, you know, everybody hides behind that. Everybody says, well, I know so-and-so, and I think they're really saved, you know, but, but there's no evidence of, of, of the faith. And our Lord's word to those people is, you better make sure that you really have the faith. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And it's not, it's not a spectrum of 24 shades. It is the faith once delivered to the saints. So all right, my goal tonight is just to help you to stand and to not be afraid to think in, in, in a Bible way about what real faith really is. Let's pray. They're always after you to tone it down. You know what? Don't tone it down. Don't apologize for the Bible. Don't apologize that you believe what the Bible says. Be nice. Be sweet. Be kind. The Bible says be courteous to all men. But you can be courteous and still love and be part of the faith. Lord, bless this truth. I pray you'd help us, Lord. In a world that is always trying to change us, Lord, and in a Lord, in an atmosphere of Christianity that is so unfriendly to real Bible truth. Lord, help us. Help us to love everybody, Lord, just like you did. But Lord, help us not to accommodate the people. Lord, help us to be more concerned about pleasing you and about having Bible faith than about pleasing anybody else. Lord, help us in these things in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to give you just a minute, if, if the Lord perhaps has spoken to you in some way, that you could talk to him. Lord, thank you for your book. And thank you, Lord, that you make things so wonderfully and terribly clear. Thank you, Lord. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Remember to uh, tell Brother Burke uh, to have a good trip and be praying for him. And Brother Devian and his wife and, of course,